Hello and good morning, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where in the world you are joining us from today. I'm delighted to welcome you all here and welcome you to the la latest in a series of talks where we will hear from former participants of the World Technology Universities Networks Exchange Programme. Need to find a shorter way of saying that, it's quite a mouthful. Uh, the WTUN uh, is a network of global technology universities committed to undertaking cutting edge, challenge led research with the direct benefits to people and society, and also providing education for the next generation of global citizens who will have to respond to the world's 21st century challenges. Starting in the academic year 2018-19, the WTUN Exchange Programme has provided opportunities for member institutions to explore or conduct activities stated in the WTUN MOU, and more information of which can be found on the WTUN website. We welcome applications from all member institutions, and each year there are between 18 and 20 grants available worth £2,000 each for staff, both academic and professional services, and PhD students to apply to visit another member institution. Exchanges are open to new projects, initiatives, and teaching and learning opportunities, as well as those that have been involved in previous rounds and wish to utilise the funds to continue their work. Each of our speakers in this series have participated in a visit funded by the WTUM programme to a fellow WTUM member institution in the 2021-22 cycle. Our speaker today has generously given their time to join us to reflect on that experience and share some of the technical aspects of their ongoing research focus. For those of you watching who may consider applying for the WTUM exchange programme later in the year, we hope that today's session inspires you to do so. What our speaker will also hopefully do is encourage um, those of you who may uh, not automatically consider applying for a grant under the title World Technology Universities Network. Um, hopefully our speaker will um, make it very clear that or even if you're not engaged in research or activities in what we might call the hard sciences or um, technical research, that the WTUN as part of um, its links to the UN SDGs is encouraging interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary activities also. We, I will soon hand you over to our speaker. There will be plenty of time to ask questions towards the end of today's session, so do pop them in the Q&A box or we'll allow for, for live questions um, should you so wish at the end. Today our speaker is Professor Fiona McCauley, who's Professor of Gender, Peace and Development at the University of um, Bradford in the Department of Peace Studies. Fiona is also um, the director of the Rotary Peace Centre. Professor McCauley's research in areas include women's movement, politics, human rights and criminal justice reform in Brazil, especially and Latin America more generally. By the WTUN, Professor McCauley spent two weeks at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Brazil, collaborating with colleagues in anthropology, law and gender studies. And she's here today to speak about that experience. So without further ado, Thank you very much, Fiona. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, it was a pleasure to be here. And then it was an absolute pleasure to be in the north of east of Brazil for two weeks. Um, what I'm going to do is share my screen now because I've got some nice photos of the things that I was doing. They're not too many slides. Um, I'll try and speak for no more than sort of 20, 25 minutes and then take questions. But obviously, Denise, if there's any questions in the chat, people wanting clarification as I go along, please feel free to interrupt me and ask. So I'm just going to share my screen now. That should work. We tested it earlier. We think we're good, aren't we? Yes, you can see uh, my screen. That's fantastic. So um, let me just say a little bit about where this university is. Um, it is the only uh, Brazilian university on the list. Um, so I hadn't looked previously. When I did, I was very excited. Um, because as you can see, it's just on the, the edge, the corner of Brazil, sort of the northeast heading north. Um, and the picture on the side is, is more or less what I was looking at every day from my apartment, um, which is quite nice. Um, so I, two things. One is that I, I had a long standing uh, relationship research wise um, with a colleague at this university. Um, and I will talk about that in a moment when I talk about the prisons research that I do and that she does. And so I think that was the first thing that made me consider applying for this because um, I knew um, Juliana, my colleague there, 
Um, we had exchanged quite a lot of uh, material over the years. We had a long-standing interest in the same topic. And therefore, I knew that I'd be able to slot in pretty easily. I didn't necessarily know people in other departments, but I will say that one of the successful things was being able to work more broadly with people across social sciences. So she technically is in anthropology, even though you might think, well, she works at prison. Surely that must mean she's in criminology or sociology. But I did end up with working with colleagues in um, uh, the, the law department because of their work on feminist law theory and so forth. So I was able to actually before in the process of putting together the application, it was very useful for me to actually talk to her several times by Skype and talk about who else we could connect to. So she was very good at saying, oh, you need to speak to so and so. Have you contacted so and so? So by the end, I had a pretty good idea of what I could achieve um, once I, I, I got there. So the three areas of research that I work on are, the first one is on prisons. I've worked on this for a long time. I used to work for Amnesty International as their Brazil um, researcher. And many Brazilian prisons are horrific in terms of human rights violations. And that's how Juliana, my research contact and I connected because she was uh, literally standing outside the prison gates of a massacre in a prison in Rio Grande do Norte in Natal, the, the capital city, as it was unfolding. And I helped to connect her to the international human rights organizations that could help her. So, uh, in the end, the work that she was doing was um, so dangerous to her, she was getting death threats that she had to leave the state for two years, but she had returned. So the and hu more humane approaches is what we concentrated on during my visit. Um, and it turned out that she was working on um, uh, community led prison approaches that I had actually been researching for at least 10 years and essentially opened up a field of study that nobody else had been working on. So Brazil is very curious. It has this kind of, you know, it has some dreadful human rights abuses occurring, which obviously when I was at Amnesty, I was documenting, which I have worked on. But it's led me very much to thinking about how do you improve things? How do you make things better? Who are the change makers in the institutions? Um, and I'm always very positive in a funny way. I always think you can find the good people, the good institutions, the good initiatives and projects that you can work with. The second area of research, um, I will explain in a moment. And again, the same thing is true, right? I mean, um, many Brazilian police officers and institutions commit human rights abuses. They torture people, they disappear people, they kill people um, uh, without trial. Um, however, there are many dedicated police officers also working on preserving human life and trying to make a positive change. So again, I come back to my own kind of position, which is, you can only ask institutions to do better. And by asking them to do better, you look at what they already are actually doing pretty well. And I wanted very much to honor and talk to those police officers who were actually making change. So although I was embedded in, an, in a, a university while I was over in Rio Grande do Norte for two weeks, uh, this has been a kind of a research framework for me for a few years now. And then the final point is about police officers who are deciding to give up their police career for political career. So I'm going to talk about that in a, in a second. So let me just start with the, the, the police reform initiatives and how this relates to my visit um, to uh, the uni Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. So... Um, in the past, as I was researching these APAC prisons, you can see the the uh, the, the um, acronym there, APAC, which has a number of translations, but it's basically assisting people in prison to be better. Now, you might say that's what prisons are meant to do, but I think we all know that a lot of prisons actually make people worse because of the way that they treat them while they're imprisoned. In the past, I had pretty much gone in and interviewed in another part of the country and um, this was an opportunity for me not to be the outsider coming in, interviewing staff, interviewing inmates, uh, and difficult actually to do ethnography because most, 96% of prison inmates are male. Now I'm not, so uh, I can't really stay overnight in a prison. I can't really hang out um, 
So my opportunities for sort of part, what you might call participant observation or what in the literature is a lovely term is kind of poking and soaking, you know, hanging out, watching things, making notes, just getting the feel of the place. Very hard for me actually to do. So this was a fantastic opportunity because Juliana, who is here at the front, um, has been working for the two years with her law students and human rights students and anthropology students here. She teaches a course on human rights and anthropology. And this is one of her PhD students. They have been visiting this small community run prison on the coast every week for a year, delivering an outreach program and very much building up a relationship of trust with the inmates. This is a small prison. There's only about 35 men in prison there. They're all from the local community, from the vicinity. And so I was able to join in with that weekly trip. Um, I was able to pay for the van, which is pretty important considering that these students don't have money you know, to chip in even for a kind of a minibus to take them two hours there, stay overnight and come back. Um, I was asked, you know, would you like to do something with the, the inmates? And I remembered the project we've been running at the University of Bradford, which is exploring ideas of human rights through theatre, through uh, the work of Auguste Bois, who is a like leading, leading uh, Brazilian uh, theorist of the theatre. So here you can see in the middle picture that I am directing all of this. So the pictures are taken by the uh, the, 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 the prison director. Um, and I ran a workshop, basically scribbled some notes in the in the minibus before we got there and used what existing knowledge I had, the work I'd done with students at Bradford in the Peace Studies uh, Department to um, to run this. So you can see the, the degree of trust in these two images. And this is Juliana helping direct one of the groups. This is one of the st law students who's been hoisted up by the, the inmates. Uh, degree of trust. Um, because there was this existing relationship. Now, of course, there's no way I could have gone in to this situation cold and done this because they wouldn't have known me or they would have had no contacts for me. So so this was, a, a, for, for me, an extraordinary experience to be able to do this. And uh, just to translate the, the motto of these community-run prisons is here on the wall. It says, Do amor ninguém foge means nobody escapes from love. And you can see that this is, um, a, an imprisonment experience, an incarceration experience, which is based on education, emotional education, um, debate, discussion, understanding, and a, a very humane approach to transforming people, utterly different from some of the hell holes that I have visited in the past. So what did I take away from this? Well, first of all, for me, it gave me an opportunity to be immersed in a situation that would be difficult for me to access. And secondly, I was very pleased to hear the students who were with me and also the colleagues, um, both Juliana and her other colleague, Natasha, saying we've never used these techniques before, but we can totally see how A, they're relatively simple. They're not fancy. They're pretty simple. And B, having participated in this workshop I could now go and do this I can now use these techniques in my social work uh, in my work with human rights and, and in future work with these same prisoners so I was very pleased that they were immediately sort of inspired to to do more of the same so actually I'm just going to go I'm going to continue with the, the theme of of institutions um because one of the things that I have done, uh, I published uh, about a, a year and a half ago, two years ago, a book looking at what's called feminicide. Feminicide is the murder of women for gender based reasons. And generally speaking, it's in the context of domestic violence, that women are murdered by their partners or their former partners. As, as you know, in this country, about two women every week are murdered by a partner or former partner. Now, this book took about three or four years to gestate. And in the meantime, I was writing with partners in Brazil, um, a manual on police training. It was a train the trainers kind of manual. So it was intended for people in the police or outside the police who were training the police and other involved actors in how to think about and approach domestic violence, gender-based violence. And one of the things I discovered was that the police in many different parts of Brazil 
had actually initiated their own very effective means of preventing women being murdered by their former partners, which is to say that when women get a restraining order from the local judge, they follow up immediately. So can you see this vehicle here that I'm standing in front of? That is what's called a Maria da Peña patrol car. Maria da Peña is the woman, the survivor of domestic violence uh, after whom the law is named. And these special police units will follow up immediately with the victim and the perpetrator um, and explain to the survivor, the, the person who has reported the violence, that they will be visited every week. They explain to the perpetrator that they're watching him, they may monitor him with a tag, um, and they will... It, it's extraordinarily successful um, because it gives women security that genuinely the police are interested in their case and keeping an eye on things. The local community is more likely to report domestic violence because they are sure that the police will in fact act. And because the perpetrator is, is being tagged, then he knows that he's being monitored and that is enough for him to stay away. So what was really interesting, again, in this visit was that I had never been able to go on patrol with these units. I'd interviewed them. I'd visited them in their headquarters. I'd interviewed people on Skype during the COVID lockdown and so forth. But this was the first occasion in which I could meet both a large group of officers. So you can see me standing here with the women and men from the municipal patrols, and they all came together. Again, wonderful that the, the local police division invited them all to come and meet me so I could talk to them collectively. The, the same thing happened with the military police patrols same thing, I had an opportunity to talk to many officers. And then I said, well, gee, I'd, you know, it'd be great if I could go on patrol. And they immediately said, yes, of course you can. So there I am with, um, uh, we've just been um, to visit a victim. And this is me with the military police. Um, and this is the municipal police car. Now, what I wanted to say about this was the opportunity that it gave me, first of all, to hear from the officers in a more informal setting. And secondly, when we did go to visit a victim, which, of course, is um, something that I could never do remotely. There'd be no way in which really it would have been ethically or logistically possible for me to have had the same quality of conversation with a survivor of domestic violence and to find out how they were experiencing their interaction with the police. So being there in person to, to me, which just gave me a whole different level of understanding of how these police operated and also how they were delivering services to the public. So although I've written one small thing about this and published it, this is going to form the basis of a much uh, longer piece of writing, maybe a short book about how this is this is working. By the way, the transferability of this to the UK is very, very high. In fact, something very similar was piloted in West Yorkshire in the mid 90s. And ironically, it was a police officer somewhere else in Brazil who read a report about what had happened in West Yorkshire. Um, and the review, by the way, was done here at the University of Bradford, fantastic document published on the Home Office website. And then that inspired that officer to copy the same methodology. So this is good practice which can be transferred from the global south back to the global north. And I think that's a really important point because Denise talked about challenges in society. And we all know that domestic violence is actually a really significant challenge. In Britain, as I said, two women a week are murdered by their partners. And that figure has not changed in 10 years. So clearly, learning from one another from north to south, south to north is pretty important. So that's part of the, the intention of this uh, world technology network, that that learning should occur. Um, and the final um, piece of research is something which is ongoing for me. Um, and I've been looking at the um, uh, the phenomenon, which is very marked in Brazil, of police officers deciding to run for elected political office. And here you can see a mixture. These are the four men that I did actually interview um, in uh, Natal. Um, some of them in the state, two in the state assembly, one federal deputy in the National Congress and a senator. Um, and I really wanted to find out for them what their motivations were for going into politics. 
what their worldview was, how they understood law and order, how they understood human rights and so forth. And what, of course, I discovered was quite a diversity. Uh, I can talk more about them because they were all very fascinating in their own ways. But this is something on which there is nothing written. Uh, there is nothing published. It's, it's, a, it's a very Brazilian phenomenon. But again, if you're looking at social challenges about law and order and violence reduction, then we really have to understand a phenomenon such as, you know, the, the hundreds, thousands of police officer, officers at every election attempting to get elected and to shape that, that discussion. Um, politically. So there are three kind of collaborations that came in addition to um, these interviews that I was doing. So as I said, the visits to the prison, the ride-alongs and interviews with the police and with the police officers were fantastic, but I also was very busy being invited to give talks. Um, so let me just um, tell you about three additional things that I did. So my collaborator and partner, uh, Juliana Mello, um, as I said, she teaches human rights and she's increasingly working on refugees. So one of the things that I was able to do was um, take teach her classes on human rights um, and reflect on how the UK debate on refugees is going. Um, and in particular, how places like the University of Bradford and the city of Bradford, along with many other cities and universities in the UK, are much, much more welcoming and integrative of refugees than the national government appears to be at the moment. And why is this interesting for, from a sort of crossover transfer perspective? Because Brazil increasingly is receiving refugees. I mean, it hasn't received many in large numbers um, up until now, but there's a huge flow of refugees from Venezuela in the north, an increasing number of refugees coming from African countries. And it's something which they are beginning to think about and beginning to understand. And so I was very pleased that this could translate into an initiative at university and city level, which would might mirror the, what we've done in Bradford. And also that this will be a future area of research collaboration between me and Juliana, she's in France at the moment studying that very question. But this will be this is a relatively new area uh, for Brazilians just because of, of their geography and, and sheer size. The second image here, I was able to join in um, a, a conference it was a fantastic two day conference, no three day conference. It was hybrid um, on law and feminism. Uh, from the organized by the law department at the university so I gave a paper on my feminicide research but uh, what I was most struck by was the very very high quality of multidisciplinary debate and production um, not just amongst the staff at the university but also master's students PhD students and even undergraduates and I think that's one of the things that we can really learn from Brazil is that they take undergraduate research training and, and production very seriously. So some terrific work is being done at levels that where we might not think that there's much original research being generated, like graduate dissertation, undergraduate dissertations or master's dissertations. So I came away going kind of basically, wow, that's amazing. And I definitely want to collaborate more with them in the future because I think that they, they have such a solid body of research. And then the third image here was a, uh, was a, a, a two-day online um, set of papers, conference about uh, the anthropology of law, but particularly looking at the prison system. And uh, again, what was really interesting was I was talking about my research um, on uh, the criminal justice system actors. So for example, the judges and the prosecutors and why they are so resistant to promoting human rights compliance in the prison system. But from the other point of view, she had, in, Juliana had invited the prisoners from the Apax prison that we had visited to be part of that academic panel and to give their perspective on the experience of imprisonment from inside a prison. And again, that I think was something that I really learned from, which is that you need many, many different voices. And often in academia, we speak for people 
and think we're the clever ones and think we can analyze their experiences and we don't always open up as much space as we should to actually listening to the people who are actually experiencing uh, I think that's that's a very important um, lesson indeed and I think that there that the the UFRN's uh, approach to outreach is something we could definitely learn from engagement with the local community I think is how we'd kind of translate that so just getting to my final slide here so where is all of this taking what did I learn and well, how are we going to take this forward and one of the things that I made a case for in my application originally was where do we learn from so when I say de decentering knowledge production we tend to think that the best knowledge is produced by experts in the top universities in the global north and then we transfer that knowledge so this whole idea of knowledge transfer I, I do often sometimes question because I think that the direction of travel and the epicenters are not necessarily where we think so if you look if you remember the map that I showed of um, Brazil you can see that Rio Grande do Norte is quite a long way from the mega city down south of Sao Paulo Rio de Janeiro the places that people have heard of and in Brazil itself, there's a tendency to think that the best research is being done in those universities and that knowledge is being done there. And I think it's really important to question that and to and to see and find and celebrate the excellence that exists um, elsewhere. As I was saying that, you know, the, the for example, the Lawn Feminism group that I discovered, which is, you know, fantastic quality. I'm going to come to this point that Denise mentioned already about social technologies. And so my research, my partners in Hugo Notre were surprised that um, we were going to apply under a technology heading because they were in anthropology, law, sociology, politics. But technology just means how to, right? That's all the word technology means. So if you ask the question, how do you prevent women from being murdered by their violent ex-partners, the technology they have introduced are these police dedicated police patrols um with all of the underpinning philosophy procedures institutional mechanisms and so forth that sustain that technology and it works I agree because I know that no woman who has been enrolled in those programs has been murdered by her former partner um so that was a big surprise to my partners over there who said oh we never thought about what we did humane approaches to imprisonment um pr prevention of violence as a technology we thought this was all going to be the engineering department folk involved in this so that was a really interesting conversation that to, to, to rethink ideas of, I mean what you might you might more commonly call it social policy I guess but thinking of it as a technology a how-to how do we prevent violence how do we genuinely re-socialize prisoners to re-enter society how do we humanely integrate refugees into our city and our university and our society those are all how-to questions and therefore they're technology questions they're social technologies and Brazil actually in many ways has been pioneer in some of these technologies um, but there's a sort of a disconnection between some of the bigger sort of grander policies and what's happening locally. And I think that was something that was really interesting for me to discuss with my colleagues over there. And then I think I mentioned the final point, which is that um, uh, seeing how the university interacts with the local community uh, and, and on long ongoing projects like the year, two year project with, the, the, um, with that prison, which is a good two hours drive away, uh, was really interesting again because it was completely evident that the students from undergraduates to masters to PhD students to junior colleagues were all learning a huge amount in being involved in that um, outreach project. So I had an amazing time in two weeks. It was very busy, um, and I want to thank again the 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 WTUN for funding it because it was an extraordinary opportunity. And as I said, you know, I will be continuing the connections that I made around all of these topic areas um, in the future. But I'm sure people have questions. So I'm going to stop talking now and just hear from other people, comments or questions. Thank you, Denise. Um, 
Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, that was really, really interesting. And I think um, one of the things that jumped out to me at the end was the reframing um, the, the, you know, the concept of technology into the very simple how to um, and you know, the social policy as social technology, which I think will be of interest to, to many of our colleagues around the network and hopefully um, you know, do some of the work in um, getting people out of, I guess, siloed thinking as well and that real leaning into the multidisciplinary um, concept that I think a lot of our members um, are very pro. It's definitely something that I'm seeing um, across different regions of the world that, you know, some are perhaps more experienced or have that much more embedded in their in their curriculum teaching and learning than others. But it seems something that e whether it's via things like, um, you know, social policy and social engagement, whether it's things around um, entrepreneurship and innovation as well, and taking those outside of um, I guess you know the business schools and things like that and into this so um I, I think we do have um some questions for you um and it's uh, come from Steve so I'll, I'll read this out although um if you know you would have the option to say it out loud Steve if, you, if you'd prefer but um he said what was your um, initial connection with Brazil do you speak Portuguese and did you find that there were ever there were other cultural challenges yeah so yes I do speak Portuguese I speak pretty fluent Portuguese. So that's really helpful. So my initial contact with Brazil was when I was doing my doctorate. So I had started, I was in Latin American studies, I already spoke Spanish by that point. And then I decided to move on from my master's and my PhD to do a comparative study of Brazil and Chile. So that led me to Brazil, that led me to learn Portuguese. And then I joined the team at Amnesty International, just after I finished my doctorate. So that was a pretty steep immersion and pretty much improved my my Portuguese quite a lot at that point because I was visiting Brazil a lot and obviously not you know talking a language about criminal justice systems and also you know interviewing prisoners and so forth so that was really really helpful so I have had a long connection my first visit to Brazil was 1993 so that's that's quite a long time that's 30 years I think about that. Um, I would say that the language issue should be taken into consideration because um, in other regions of the world, English might be much more commonly spoken as a kind of lingua franca. In Latin America, it's less common. So if you don't speak any of the local language at all, if you don't speak Spanish or Portuguese, then it will be quite hard to have the kinds of experience that I had. Um, you know, some people will speak some English and much more commonly in a university setting. Staff, of course, will have had to prove that they have, you know, competence in another language. Um, as it happened, my research partner speaks French because her husband is French, but, you know, others will speak English or German or something else. But it's, it's perhaps more of a barrier for Latin America than it might be for, say, Asia. Mm -hmm. so, was that the whole question, Jay? I think I answered all of it. Um, I think so. Definitely the focus, I guess, the the, uh, the second part was just if there was any other cultural challenges that, that, that cared to you. Um, uh, not, not for me, really, because I've been going to Brazil for 30 years. So mm -hmm. I'm, quite, I'm pretty familiar uh, with the culture. Uh, it's not it's not a huge difference. I mean, there are micro, obviously there are small things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love Brazilian culture, um, but there's nothing which is very, very challenging. And I and I like it because it's an extremely friendly culture and it's a very open culture. As you can see from the pictures of me directing that theatre workshop in the prison, I mean, people just jumped in straight away. There was, I mean, it's also partly a function of what I was actually doing with them. Um, but yeah, people were extremely open um, and friendly and welcoming. But I'm sure that that would be true of all of the universities in the network in any case. So, I mean, I, I absolutely think that's an important question, because if I were to go somewhere like Indonesia, I personally would feel, gosh, I've got not a clue about the cultural norms. Mm -hmm. So I was I stayed within my comfort zone because I knew that I could get the maximum value out of a two week stay um, because I felt that comfortable. But it would be quite challenging, I think, if you didn't. Mm -hmm. Not impossible, yeah. but you just have to consider it. You just have to think, well, what will be my strategy for, you know, who's going to interpret for me or, you know, yeah, you just have to think it through. 
Yeah, I think that's a really good, uh, it's a good question. It's a good thing to consider when um, planning the actual physical attendance and how much, you know, what you can realistically achieve, you know, the access that you have. I think your presentation illustrated very well, you know, there was a lot of trust there and a lot of, um, you know, like you said, moving from a remote environment into actually being able to speak to people and have that access and and build those relationships I think it's a good reminder that a lot can be done you know these these collaborations pre-existed this this visit um but you can't really replicate those sort of face-to-face to be able to sit down and um to work with the different police that you were able to then participate in and then feeling reassured and happy and comfortable for you to to join in and, and learn more about their work I think you know, I'm sure it goes without saying that that was an access that you, you just wouldn't have been able to replicate if you'd, um, like you said, and also touching upon being able to work directly with the communities that they were serving and, and victims of the of the work that they were doing. Um, I also found it really interesting what you were saying about, and I think it serves as a really good reminder, and it's something that, of course, a network such as ours, which is, um, you know, very much was set up and prides itself on, you know, this concept of sort of non-elitist uh, membership and you know not being preoccupied with with rankings and having a truly global membership but just that reminder that you know good practice that can be transferred from the global south to the global north is a reality um, and that's and it's certainly not a, a rarity or an exception but you've been able to come back with sort of living proof of that um, if I may I'd, I'd be interested to know what your um, plans are with regards to sort of further collaborations I know you did touch on some of the, the things that you'll be doing with Juliana and I'm sure that research partnership will continue and I suppose from the W2N's expect, uh, perspective what perhaps the network might be able to do um, both in your case and just more broadly to support this as a starting point so if we take the the exchange funding as as maybe a starting point how we can support um this ongoing collaboration if you have any ideas or perhaps even any requests from our network of what we could perhaps do well i think it does raise really interesting questions because often in sort of academic life you kind of you're looking for research partners um in diverse areas um so for example i'll, I'll talk about the work on feminicide right i mean the there is an issue which is global right women being killed by their their, their partners um now, I know a lot about it in one context, but what I'd really like to find is people I could work with or would be working on similar issues in very different contexts. And so I don't know how one does that through the through the, the, the network, but that would be the kind of how can we find out who we could access across the network? And I think that's I, I don't think that's a simple question because, I mean, um, if that requires a deep dive, a, you know, perhaps the network could set up um, some kind of connection point. And I don't know whether it's a webinar like this, where people working on very specific, I better say very specific, I mean, certain kinds of issues mm -hmm. actually join in and say, well, actually, did you know my institution were doing this? So, for example, cities. Sustainable cities is another interest of my teachers and so forth. Now, clearly, so many issues affect cities, right? Everything from sort of engineering, roads, sewage, through to the human interaction with that physical environment. Um, ditto the questions of violence, right? Mm -hmm. So that's more in, within what I do directly. Who is it that we could identify Let's just ask a question like across the WTUN network, who is working on gender based violence and what are they looking at or who is working on, you know, I don't know how specific to make it or how general to make it, but somehow I feel like I would be able to access or work with more people across the network if I knew who was there. But I do understand that that's a really difficult thing to achieve to map who's out there because these are you know they're, they're, every institution is complex right I mean if I don't know the work of everybody in my own faculty then <laughs> trying to figure out who's out there but I'm just wondering whether it might be possible to generate sort of open sort of pieces calls or 
to, to get people to step forward and say actually hey I do actually work on this at my or in my institution you should talk to the law department or I don't know I think I think that would be the most useful thing to me because I can work on a one-to-one basis with my research collaborators at the uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Not. I mean I can take that forward individually I can keep those partnerships going but I wonder how you scale them up into something which is more international and how we connect for example the fantastic group in the law department working on law and feminism which is really doing great stuff I was so impressed how we connect them to others because I think one of the things for Brazilians is that they often feel like a little bit of a backwater mm-hmm. um, they often feel like maybe because of linguistic barriers I mean that's one thing that you can't really do very much about but on the other hand, like every university in, in the world, they, they are told you must be more international. You should be more international. So they were really surprised that I was there through the WTUN for the reasons that you, we've talked about, the idea of social technologies. Mm-hmm. But linking them somehow back so that they can be more active participants and more connected, not just to me but mm-hmm. to, or Bradford, but to other parts of the network would be useful and I don't think they've caught I'm sure they're quite sure about that at the moment yeah yeah I mean you've 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 summed up um you know a big a big preoccupation of mine and you know and 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 my role and and sort of um facilitating these introductions and thinking about ways that we can um get into institutions and get them to know each other the challenges are exactly what you've said you know the institution's big and complex and you know there's great work happening and like you, you know it might be happening in the office next door and you're as li- likely to know about it as you are you know if it's happening halfway around the world um, but I think that one of the things that we've been discussing is the concept of some kind of for want of a better word and I'm I'll have to come up with a better theme perhaps that might translate internationally, but, you know, speed dating or some kind of, you know, matching events where we can exactly that, have a thematic um, series and then just invite people and they could do maybe very short pitches or, you know, one slide um, overviews of some of the research that they're working on, where they're actively seeking or just open to collaboration. But it did make me think just as you were talking then about in the run up to launching the application round for next year whether something like this could be part of that so actually saying um you know we're hosting these like we would for students you know information sessions to come along learn more about the exchange program but get them thinking outside of, of those and your um case study will be a great example of you know perhaps um getting outside the the, the laboratories and the the engineering faculties and, and across the universities a little bit more so thank you for that um, I would say on a sort of more immediate level of course if there's uh, ongoing connections with your colleagues at UFRN um, you know reciprocal applications are also welcome so you know to continue these these things if there are people working as I said both at PhD level or um, also as faculty um, UFRN will also be able to apply you know, perhaps to come come in this direction as well. So um, there's no barrier to, to do that. And I have spoken with some colleagues who, um, faculty members who partake in an exchange and a way of um, facilitating ongoing or deepening the research is actually then encouraging PhD students in their faculty to sort of take that up yeah as well so um would be really interested to see some applications and also from professional staff or you know staff that aren't maybe as traditionally coming under the research umbrella but are still engaged within work as well so um yeah i I don't know that we have any more more questions at at this point um fiona but that was a a really great retrospective um probably seems quite a long time ago since you were in brazil (laughs) yeah yeah, it does actually (laughs) But, uh, you know, I'm still I'm still definitely got my notebooks full of all the notes I took there. So it, as with these things, you know, you you you, you cram in a, a trip, which was absolutely fantastic. And then you kind of come back and then everything else happens, teaching and other commitments. And um, so I'm hoping over the summer that now I've got the calm to kind of actually process all of the field notes that I took and uh, and think about that kind of building process. But but yes, it was an amazing opportunity to be somewhere that I did not know that has a very interesting history that was very, very, you know, um, yeah, very fruitful indeed for me personally. But I think that the wider point of this is that it should be building 
uh, across the network. And if I may sort of end with a few sort of thoughts, I've been thinking a lot about, you talked about right at the beginning about people in society and global challenges. And I think the biggest, you know, although I work on domestic violence and violence in general, the other issue that none of us can escape at the moment is climate crisis, climate breakdown and the circular economies. Um, and I think that's probably something I would like to, to, to know or we'll see how there could be, from a WTUN perspective, a really concerted effort to pull resources around something which is so immediate. Not at all what I research, but in the bigger picture of things, yeah. you know, every institution needs to be figuring out what can we do now to, mm -hmm. to, to change what we do and how we do it now. Mm -hmm. I don't think we've ever faced such an impending catastrophe. Yeah, and, um, and yeah, absolutely. And it has permutations right across, you know, it, it, it impacts and shows up in all kinds of different ways and um, out of different, you know, it's not a disciplinary, unique to any one discipline and the challenge is one for all. And I think having, you know, even a, a link to the focus areas that we try to elicit when it comes to, you know, selecting the SDGs of focus and things like that, you can see that the through line of a lot of these things is things around things like climate action. You know, they, they crop up in clean water and sanitation and gender equity and affordable yeah. and clean energy. They're all they're inextricably linked. Um, and without going into any detail, I guess that's perhaps one of the, the arguments against all of the challenges of these you know, headline 17 goals is that does that encourage silo thinking by virtue of having them separated into into these in di disparate goals when actually there's there's so much in, in overlap and yeah they all interconnect i mean you know the the you know the refugees for example are arriving because of climate change uh, and the wars that they're fleeing from are also stimulated by climate breakdown yeah. um and you know we may well have with resource scarcity we may well have more violence Mm -hmm. so yeah they are all very much interconnected yeah, um absolutely. yeah i've just been thinking about this a lot it's hard not to with the headlines at the moment with the wildfires everywhere um and thinking you know we we can only work we can only do what we can do where we are and if we're in in, in universities and we've got a network how do we you know mm -hmm. scale up what we do yeah. Uh, which is not to say that you know you're only going to take applications for people who want to work on that issue but it's an, it's something I just want to kind of th throw out there that we need to be bigger than the sum of our parts yeah absolutely and um, and so the, the the annual congress for the WTUN that happens every year um, it's been hosted by colleagues in in Germany this year so at TU Ilmenau um, in Erfurt in Germany the headline the overall theme of that um, it's a very broad theme, but it's, it's sustainability. But within that, it's the it's the global trends and that role and responsibility of, of universities and technology universities, the impact, the responsibility, the response, but also driving driving those out of that as well. So it'd be really interesting to see some of the, the work that comes out of some of the sessions that are happening at that. And, and it also gives us an opportunity to hear more about what our members are doing um, and you know their position within their community whether that's their campus their locality their region their their national government so um, looking ahead to that I think there'll be some interesting things but you've given me a lot of food for thought as well so um, thank you again for your time um, as we approach the the summer I do hope you'll get some respite this summer yeah. but I know that that's not really such a thing in academia anymore I, I think the days of having quiet summers are pretty much over aren't they yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Unless anyone else has any more questions, um, I'm we're going to bring today's session to a close. Um, the webinar will be has been recorded, um, and we will share, of course, with our members. Um, I'll make sure that our colleagues in uh, in UFRN are aware that we've met today. Um, I will have the pleasure of speaking with the rector um, Jose Mello uh, at the uh, congress in October as well. He'll be attending, so um, I've met met him last year, and I'll be meeting him again. So I'll um, perhaps. Do a bit of campaigning on on your behalf to sort of encourage some ongoing collaboration and perhaps get some visitors from ufrn back in this direction as well that would be fantastic and as i said i was you know they were fantastic and uh you know couldn't have done more for me during my visit so very very grateful to them great well thank you very much it was a pleasure to meet you sort of finally in person and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day thanks very much bye bye now. thank you bye bye